Reed, and uh, remotely joining us in a sort of spatial, uh, terrestrial way is uh, Ong Perry. Um, so I guess our talk is talk exploring fandom as an alternative um, network. Okay. Um, we're going to be here to talk fun. about the ways that we. Uh, Maya, Owen, and myself self-identify as artists and or writers and or curators who bring fan-like perspectives into our work and uh, kind of exploring how fandom can cultivate an alternative means of capacity building and storytelling. Um, so before we begin, just so you have a really clear sense of what we're bringing to the table in our kind of expertise, um, I'm just going to read our bios. Um, so, I am a Toronto-based artist, writer, curator, and public programmer. Um, I have an expanded practice that includes on offline space development, image making, performance, and critical engagement with networked publics. Um, my work's been presented at the Whitney, uh, the AGO, the Société des Arts Technologies, Nuit Blanche, and Moogfest. And I currently oversee public programming um, at the Gardner Museum, and I'm on the board of directors for the Music Gallery. Maya uh, is a Toronto-based Jewish-Iranian anthropomorphic airplane. Working in video, installation, and performance, she creates worlds and characters that aid her ongoing exploration of anthropomorphism, yellow, I'm first, <laughs> um, cosplay, and performative personas. Uh, ben David presents the origin stories of her characters in the form of video and performance and expands on them via her online presence. They often inhabit alternate universes accompanied by nostalgia, such as the worlds of Pokemon and Spider-Man. Anything else to add? No, it's perfect. Awesome. And um, Owen G. Perry, and Maya's going to explain to you how Owen is joining us today, is an artist and researcher working across live art, theater, installation, moving image, sound, and writing, exploring subjects including gay sex, biopolitics, fandoms, online cultures, and Yoko Ono. With an interest in minor, colloquial, and collective processes, the subversion of avant-garde aesthetics into the mainstream, and modes of sincerity within late capitalism, he uses art to ask questions, to heal, to subvert power structures, and to imagine other more pleasurable ways of living and just being together. And he's currently a lecturer uh, in fine art at Goldsmiths. So, this is who we are. And um, I guess just a disclaimer is that we realize we're kind of presenting to this really esteemed audience with a very tech background, unless I got that wrong. And we're, no, there's lots of different experiences here, right? Okay, great. So with that in mind, we are just wanting to, if at any moment in talking in like art world speak or fan speak, and there's something that you don't, you're like, what? Put up your hand, we'll answer it, because we are just really um, want to talk about this in a very open and clear uh, way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So Owen is not here, he lives in the UK, and he provided us with a PowerPoint where he's just gonna kind of go through all of uh, his work. He's kind of give, gonna give us a little overview um, and there's audio in it, so I'll just be going and um, playing it through, and I'm going to load it up right now. Yeah, so basically the format is that we're going to each kind of come up and kind of talk about um, our individual works and practices, kind of just a crash course, and how those practices connect with fan methodology. And then, then we're going to then kind of have a conversation, Maya, Owen remotely, uh, textual and myself, and we're going to kind of unpack some of these ideas that really interest us that I think ties again to this storytelling capacity building, this network culture aspect of fandom that excites us all. So. Okay, I'm going to play Owen's PowerPoint. Um, okay, so it's probably uh, useful for me to begin by saying a little bit about my own art practice and how it intersects with fandom or how I explore fandom as a kind of methodology in my art practice. So um, in 2015 I initiated um, a kind of expansive project called Van Riot which um, which kind of came about as a way of me re-engaging with my own practice as a fandom. It came about as a time where 
I was kind of excited and inspired by the amount of fan activity that was happening online. And I was interested in this idea that kind of fans were upstaging artists in the sense that they were making works that were kind of much more interesting or um, had the opportunity to be much more subversive or collectively um, engaging. And I found that really inspiring. So that kind of partly initiated the project. But it was also a way of me returning to uh, look at my practice as a fan practice, because most of the works that I've created and the, my performance works have always been inspired by other artists' work. And, and I'd always been borrowing from those other artists and in a way uh, with a kind of shame around doing that. So this, in a way, was a way of kind of reclaiming reclaiming that shame of of kind of stealing and borrowing and loving other other people's works. Um, so Fan Riot, anyway, um, started with a fan being four fan clubs since. Um, and in these fan clubs, I bring fans and artists who work with fan-like tendencies into conversation to present their works um, and to open up a dialogue around, um, I suppose, the, the kind of... Um, parallel methodologies but also distinctions in, be, in being an artist and a fan or being a writer and a fan or an author or a critic um, and in a way this whole project is really looking at the intersection of, of art and fandom and how you know the internet has also kind of um, enabled a, a, a greater relationship between those things. Um, so there's been four, four fan clubs so far. Um, there's also a series of publications in this project. So um, I've been really uh, interested in, in fan fiction, reading and writing a lot of fan fiction, um, basically thinking about how fan fiction is also a critical mode in the way that it can rewrite or reimagine um, and offer a critique on a, on a on a source text. Uh, this is a publication, uh, a fanzine contribution uh, that I've made on uh, a Yoko Ono fan fiction, and there's been been various others, and I'll probably mention Yoko Ono one more time, <laughs> at least. Um, there's also been a series of artworks. Um, this is uh, the most recent work that I made, which is a, called Fick the Sky, which um, is a four-hour performance hangout um, uh, which is kind of drawing on fiction in as as a mode of uh, imagining or conjuring other worlds, and also and Larry became uh, particular to that. So I ended up creating this this monument to Larry, which became a kind of uh, fictional monument, if anything, and a, a fictional site of pilgrimage for for the Larry Stiles and fans, which included. Um, this photo manip of the boys kissing underwater, um, uh, the, uh, 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 some laundry basket, baskets in ode to kind of domestic fictions and the pregnant belly of Harry Styles. There's some um, etchings of the boys on a perspex wall that you can see that have been um, etched in and it's it's moments of evidence of the boys um, in kind of tender embrace or uh, in any kind of intimate moments that I've kind of salvaged from YouTube videos and uh, any interviews from backstage antics of the boys and then there's also this um, video piece called, uh, called Larry Shipping Ritual which is looking at the idea of shipping that is putting characters or elements into a relationship. So shipping for me in my practice has become a way of me understanding how I bring together certain different elements, including, uh, you know, as, as a kind of network, if you like. Um, so shipping becomes a way of networking both ideas, theories, materials, humans, um, all these different elements to create something or to form a new relationship. Um, this um, also included a performance by two Larry Styles and uh, a Larry Styles and lookalikes. So there's a Harry Styles and Louis Tomlinson lookalike, and I created a stage prompt to create a fan fiction. So in some ways, this this work was also archiving that, um, and also brought in Karu Kara, who was is my favorite fan artist to to uh, reimagine. Um, that performance as performed by Louis and Harry. So I'm not going to say any more about that just now. It's just like that kind of cut off, but he was like, 
was just explaining about. Sorry. He was just explaining about um, how he got a bit of backstory, but he got really into Larry through its fan art on Tumblr, and his first engagement was with this very popular fan artist named Kara Kara can't say her name. And um, so after doing this uh, installation in London where you saw these different kind of um, works that are referencing the relationship and how fans like fictionalize it, um, he then uh, commissioned a fan artist to do fan art based on the performance that he did with those actors for that performance piece. So now Maya's gonna talk about her work. Thank you. Um, so, I create these characters and personas and universes um, of the objects that I'm kind of like in love with at the moment or I feel really excited about. So one of my most popular characters is Air Canada Gal, which is an anthropomorphized sexy airplane. Um, and the one that I've recently been working on, it's my most recent character, is uh, this anthropomorphic, um, popcorn stealing insulation maiden. Cause like when I first, um, when I first got my new glasses, I walked into my apartment and I like couldn't believe that there was popcorn stealing insulation covering every single surface. And it was like, it was very erotic for me. I was just like, wow, it's just like on, it's every surface and it's kind of like pulsing and it was really beautiful. So I wanted to make this character out of it. And there's also popcorn stealing insulation has kind of been trending. People are uh, posting a lot of like, videos of scraping off popcorn ceiling insulation, which makes me angry because it's great for muffling audio and people are idiots for taking it off. <laughs> oh. That's me close up uh, next to my wall. Okay, so then my other performance that I just did recently is where I wanted to sing a love song to the popcorn ceiling insulation in my apartment. So I learned this like uh, John Denver song, which is very, very romantic. And uh, I had like, I was just sitting here in this like really beautiful dress, which is actually a dress that I used to wear to one of the bat mitzvahs that I'd always go to. And I like serenaded the popcorn ceiling insulation maiden and he like lifts me up at the end and it's like extremely romantic. And, and that took place recently at the yeah. Toronto Art Book Fair? Fair, yeah. yes. And it's gonna be a film soon. Um, and then a project that I did before that was where I created this wrestling uh, performance play where it was me dressed up as a snake girl and I was trapped in a bubble laboratory and I had to wrestle these Nazis in order to get out and get my freedom. And uh, there was a, there's like a love interest involved and uh, it's also a musical, so I sing. I like am singing My Chemical Romance and Barbara Streisand and um, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Um, so as you're gonna see throughout all of our um, practices, we're all kind of explaining how um, we're really into fandoms, but we take it really personally, and we're, we kind of vibe off of things that are going on in our lives, uh, and that's influencing our work and the things that we're obsessed with are influencing our work. So this is a, a little still from uh, the Snake Girl performance, which is I had just recently filmed, so it's not a film yet. This is where I um, cosplayed as the air conditioner from the film The Brave Little Toaster, who gets very angry and he self-destructs and it's very sad and I always wanted to hug him. And just, um, just interject, cosplay is a fan practice, and it's fans that create costumes. They're inspired by characters, real people. Um, so if you've ever gone to a convention and you see someone dressing up as a Harry Potter and someone dressing up as like a steampunk version of Harry Potter, that's like cosplay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, here's a, a little uh, cosplay I made of the Good Life Fitness bags that you see all around but I'm like a little baby dragon version of it. <laughs> um, oh, and I made Barbara Streisand into an anthroplane, and she looks really cute here. And then there was also kind of a romance between my, my stove and the stove hood, so I illustrated that. Also, I guess I'm just going through all, a lot of things that I've done, but uh, I've really been interested in slime girls recently, which are like these anthropomorphic gelatinous women 
Uh, so I made sculptures of them. And then also uh, feuding is in my practice a lot. So I like to fight people a lot. So that's why I did a lot of wrestling things. And I feuded this, art, this artist at the Whitney Museum who copied my work, which was very upsetting, and I was very angry about it. I've also feuded John Raffman, who is an artist that does things with furries a lot. Not that I have anything against furries, but I was angry with the way he used the material. And finally, I talk about vorophilia, which is like the desire to be like consumed fully or to consume like a fictional character fully. Um, so that's a little quick overview of my practice and the themes that I've been thinking about. And we're kind of going to be going through uh, the general threads of all of our practices and like touching on some of the projects that we've been working on. Um, so now Ria's going to go through some of the things that she's been thinking about and her work. Thank you, Maya. Welcome. Um, OK, so oh, I should go, oops, like open it up, slideshow. Um, OK, so uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, um, right now uh, my current fandom is One Direction. My ship is Zeri. When we talk about ship, shipping and fandom is kind of like a lot of time those creative energies and wish fulfillment will gather around a pairing. And a pairing that you believe should be real but is not real in reality. So like say in Marvel Cinematic Universe, a very popular ship is Stucky, which is Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes. I am also very interested in the MCU. So in uh, 1D, uh, a very not as popular ship as Larry is Zeri identify as a Zeri. Um, but also I should just mention that like, uh, so anyways, this is like, uh, I actually went to a Harry um, Styles concert and I made these, like I cosplayed a bit as like a Larry shipper. So um, that's a t-shirt I made. And then on the right is a t-shirt that commissioned through my friend Rosemary Heather is here, who has a, a t-shirt line called Dust Pot. And real person fiction, this spe specifically that's kind of, um, I've always been really interested in fan fiction written about real people and celebrities. Um, so my previous fandoms were like InSync, um, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, there was a time where that was kind of weird. You know, people were like, why are you doing this about real people and their real lives? But as we kind of see now with the way internets change our life and how we in some ways really construct these versions of ourselves, I feel like fandom in a way kind of preceded that. Anyways. Um, so, uh, a previous project that I did that really engaged with uh, fandom was a project that I did called Shiro's. It was from 2011-2012. It was a performing arts series um, that involved uh, local international artists that kind of gathered around this League of Legendary Ladies. So we had these like monthly events that took place at the Beaver, and every month we would like anoint a different um, female celebrity, it was always this pop star that's persevered. So we did tributes for Yoko Ono, we did tributes for Joni Mitchell. Um, this is documentation from the event we did for Dusty Springfield. And in those events, I was kind of the organizer, the salonier, um, and also I did cosplay as kind of the hostess. So if you go to parties, you see these drag queens and they're the host. So I was the host. And so this is documentation of a cosplay I did with a drag queen named Nancy Bocock and myself, where we were playing. I was Carol Pope, she was Dusty Springfield, and the whole event was kind of exploring this time that Dusty Springfield spent in Toronto in the 80s, where like her, I know if you're familiar, Carol Pope, who's from Rough Trade, they were in a relationship together that Carol Pope wrote about her autobiography. They had an apartment in Cabbage Town. And I was just, again, kind of similar fandom, this kind of interest in these like marginalized histories or kind of pulling out something, you know, queerness out. Um, it, very fascinated, again, with like how, you know, there's this kind of unknown part of Dusty Springfield living in Cabbage Town getting drunk all around town. Anyways, I'll progress. Um, and then it, just kind of citing like what I do at the garden, I do public programming. So this is just documentation from uh, stuff I've done there and organizing, seeing, so you, you know, I'm kind of a serious person. Um, so in the past like couple years, I, we both kind of have had backgrounds of coming up through fandom 
growing up in our girlhoods. So I actually made the return back to fandom a couple years ago. Um, and so uh, I've been doing a lot of research and writing uh, for different publications. So the, my entry point was actually through Wattpad, which is, I think, a startup around here. And um, it was through reading of Fifty Shades of Drake fic. Um, <laughs> But I was really, in, like, I just got really pulled into it because the cool thing about Wattpad is how it has threaded comments similar to, like, SoundCloud. So people can, like, you know, in SoundCloud, there's, like, a beat drop and at the minute someone's like, yeah. So Wattpad has that, but, like, for text. So um, I was just very interested in these stories that were written in a Wattpad of, I was in particular interested in this writer who was writing, um, like doing a version of Fifty Shades that was like hashtag black girl magic. And you can kind of see here, this is a screenshot from like showing you the commentary and basically epic story in those comments creating this community. And um, I'm very fascinated with this notion of how um, fan fiction can create these sort of collaborative fantasy spaces. Um, so then a recent piece I also talked about was uh, tying to my own personal narrative a bit and how, like, yeah, in the past two years becoming this 1D fan in Azari. And I was very interested in adult 1D fans and in particular I was very interested in, you know, I talked about Tin Hatters. Tin Hatters is a term for like, like there's people that get this is not real and then there's people that, like, they don't get, there's, the reality is a bit different. So. Uh, Larry's are known for being tin hatters, where they really believe that, like, for instance, Louis Tomlinson's child is like a puppet, and um, anyways, and this is just a picture of a photo minip. Like, there's very talented creators in fandom, and I think this is something Owen has, we talked about, is that in fandom, like, there's such a blurring between who's a fan and who's an artist. And we think that fans, in fandom, fans can be critics and have a voice. Um, so anyways, something else, um, you know, this is just a quote from someone I wrote, uh, I interviewed a filmmaker named Sharon Olivo who did a documentary about Larry Tin Hatters. And, you know, I think there's this concept that this academic Christina Bussey talks about, about, like, slash... Um, slash is basically s like shipping, like mail, mail. So when we talked about, you know, Stucky and Larry, that's slash. And, you know, the thing is, it's mostly women or like non-binary folks that are writing this. And um, there's this kind of theory about in writing these stories, because it's predominantly this like female perspective on masculinity, it's kind of querying, creating this like queer female space and this kind of re-envisioning from women of like wh of what could masculinity be. And so this is just kind of an image of a fan art by Caro Cara, the artist that Owen mentioned. And then this is just a screenshot from a piece that Owen wrote about Mpreg. There's a genre, Mpreg. Male pregnancy. Male pregnancy. Um, just again, like we can we can only get through so much, but we're just kind of sh giving you a, a sort of teaser of like the where people go with this and wh why we love it. So uh, just to kind of close, I re the most recent creative work I've done is actually written a fanfic. Um, it's really really good. <laughs> we're not. We're not showing it though. We're not showing it though. <laughs> So, um, so I kind of, you know, this was the first time I participated in a fic exchange. It was organized by two local women I know that are, um, that work with Wattpad. Um, and it was for this group. I'm part of this, like, Slack group for 1D fans, like, adult 1D fans. Um, so it was organized within that group. And so fic exchanges are very interesting because it demonstrates for, like, you know, fan fiction in these exchanges, people will organize them, and they'll organize them with the intent to create more kind of capacity in stories within a fandom. And they'll also, there's a gift economy. So because of the copyright um, aspect of fan fiction and the fact that, well, you know, if you try to, say, post your stucky, um, you know, try to actually get it published, someone from MC Marvel will probably issue, like, copyright infringement, that so much, like, for many years, fan fiction has been, like, people just writing it out of kind of love and for other people. So the exchange was, I'm kind of showing screenshots of when I got my prompts for this person. And um, I went with number three, 
Uh, no, I went with number two. Sorry, number two before sunset. And um, as a, like I'm a writer, I've written professionally, have been published in books. So I was really interested to do the fic exchange and like to really be a fan. And what was really like quite profound is how unoriginal it was, because basically someone was giving me like you're gonna write this. And it was like, okay, great. I'm gonna just write this story based on the movie Before Sunset. Great. Um, but then something really kind of profound happened because uh, our favorite thing we all connect with is the alternate universe. Um, how would you define the alternate universe? Um, there's like the canon universe. It's just like the world that's been created by um, like a corporation. And then yeah. you create like a different narrative that uh, riffs off of the original characters. So like when Maya was talking earlier about turning Barbra Streisand into an anthro plane, mm -hmm. that's a bit of an alternate universe. So this alternate universe was before sunset, but then it ended up becoming this alternate universe based on, I guess, me pulling my own personal narrative of being someone that was involved in the music scenes 10 years ago in Toronto. I you know, had some uh, time in Montreal. And something that was like, kind of weird in writing this story is that the thing that's like, so great about you know, fanish activities, the world building. And that's like what is the highest, like if you have your world building right, that is like big check off. And what was crazy is how um, it ended up being like very personal, you know? So I'm just kind of showing here to show like how unoriginal this is. <laughs> this is literally a screenshot from the script for Before Sunset. And I'm just providing a screenshot from the fic showing what I kind of pulled from that. And um, I guess, like, you know, to kind of close that, um, my interest in fandom and, and, like, this work is kind of people's ability to kind of work with uh, a canon and then to work with the fanon material because that fanon material is your own perception of these characters and this fandom, but also you're working in tandem with this collectively determined kind of notion of who these characters are. And I think we can probably maybe get into the conversation part mm -hmm. to explore that further. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about alternate universes. Yeah. Uh, so here maybe. We go. Okay. And then yeah. go to. Do you want to control this? Sure, I'll control. Okay. Okay. Let's just get this viewage. This is a sample of Owen's work, mine, Ria's. Um, and I guess I'm gonna talk a little bit about world building that we all have kind of have in common. Um, like I was explaining before, um, I kind of built this fictional world that's also based off of reality, where um, I have this character named Snake Girl, uh, who's a, like a sexy anthropomorphized snake. Um, and she's trapped in this bubble and it's run by this Nazi named Kurt Heisemeyer, who is based off of a real Nazi uh, physician. That uh, my family was is like kind of intermingled with his narrative because um, they were experimented on by Kurt Heisemeyer, one of my cousins. And the so there was like these twenty children that were experimented on in World War II, and then they were eventually murdered, and they were injected with tuberculosis. So um, they were like, it was, they were really, really sick and then they were hung. And I always wanted to make a work about it, but I have such like freaky work. I didn't really know how to, how do you talk about like the Holocaust, but, but, you, but you do like anthro sneaky things. So I, so I kind of made this character, which, which is Snake Girl, um, who is kind of like an anthropomorphic version of uh, like a Nazi propaganda uh, figure because Jews were um, represented as like snakes and rats and uh, foxes. And she goes through this whole like wrestling narrative where she um, is like a big fan and a nerd about a lot of things. And you, you hear about her inner dialogue about how she wants to sing like Barbara Streisand and how she thinks of the chamber that she's in that she's trapped in, like the hyperbolic time chamber from Dragon Ball Z, <laughs> where... Um, 
if you don't know where that what that is, uh, it's this it's this time chamber that you can go to and you can change you can train for unlimited hours and years and you leave and it's like no time passed at all. So she she kind of thinks of herself as like in this time chamber and she's like training to defeat the physician. Um, and then the, the story kind of goes that um, there's another lab assistant and the lab assistant, assistant um, is also a snake and they have to kind of collaborate together and like work against the physician, the Nazi physician via like wrestling. So there's a very epic wrestling match in the end where we also have a musical number and like I was saying before, we sing uh, Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, which is a really old musical, and also My Chemical Romance songs. Um, so I'm kind of weaving together my like personal uh, family background with things that I'm very nerdy about to facilitate this character uh, that is going to somehow like live out this uh, processing that I'm going through in thinking about my own history and things that I think about and geek out about. Um, so I know that um, a lot of us think about um, alternate universes. And um, maybe we can talk a bit more about your fic. Yeah. Um, so and fiction. to kind of, I guess, continue on of what Mai was um, talking about, because um, something I really, you know, you were, she read the fic. Um, and I was originally like, it's kind of weird because a lot of people in fandom, uh, it's kind of for it, it, for fandom for some people it's a kind of a happy place. So there's people that are very protective of their fan activity because there's just been histories of people that like people discovering their fans activity and people maybe getting fired because some people are where they go in their fandom activities can go really far out. So when I wrote this story, I was really like, I obviously shared it with my fan friends. But there's very few people, like, I, if there's any of my friends that, like, Rosemary, <laughs> that got to read it, I was like, okay, you can read it, but you cannot share it with anyone. So Maya, you read it, and I was very hesitant to share it for this talk, because I mm -hmm. didn't think, like, oh, fanfic, why should I talk about it? But you were like... <laughs> well, I said, uh, I really liked how you... I was surprised that you, like, pulled from your own personal experiences so much. Um, so I know there's, like, one part, I think it was Zane... Uh, who's from Brampton, and he's from Brampton, right? Well, well he's in the fic, he's from Brampton. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so she she changed it, uh, and he's from Brampton in the fic, and it's really great. And like, uh, there's so much there's so much like Toronto references, um, and there's a lot of references from like the time where you were growing up, and like uh, really like into the uh, music scene, like alternative music scene. And also, he speaks a lot about, like, I mean, there's kind of, like, these micro moments where he, uh, he talks about, like, his mixed identity, which I know, like, you kind of um, explore a lot in your practice. Yeah, so, um, so that was the surprising thing, is that this fanfic became, like, an opportunity for me to kind of meditate on these, I, like, things that I do in my work, where, like, hybridity, otherness, and... Um, so, like, Zane is actually British-Pakistani. He was born in Yorkshire. And in kind of then doing this AU set in Toronto, it was kind of fun to be like, okay, well, you know, it was very... Imp I, I connect with Zane because he is... I mix as well. So I was like, well, what would Zane be like in Toronto? And I was like, well, he would grow up in Brampton. And then I made Liam, like, well, Liam's from Scarborough. Yeah, that was, this was a really good part <laughs> where he... <laughs> You can say what, what happened. He just he just slips slips into like Scarborough tongue and like they have a really cute moment where uh, there's like this familiarity between the two characters. They're like, oh, I know you, and it's it's very cute. He says, don't know. Um, so so anyways, like you know, um, there's this woman I know who started the one D for um, Olds Group, and her name's Allison Gross. She's doing her P uh, PhD right now. And she's kind of exploring 1D as this like kind of populist collective object mm -hmm. where like again so many people project their own kind of meanings onto these like celebrities. And um, yeah, it was kind of crazy like in doing this like movie AU and then um, and trying to figure out the world building. AU is alternate universe. Alternate universe. And this like world building, yeah, how much I drew from my own life. And I was surprised by that kind of process of how in a way like 
I know, I guess like with Zane being this like avatar for me to explore these ideas and then Harry becoming this like Montreal rocker that like mm -hmm. maybe could have been in like MGMT and then was like in Paris as a baker. I had this like bit too that he was like working with racialized newcomers in Paris and that was like my way to comment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's like, so Harry goes, he's on tour and he weighs around pride flags. But at one of his shows, there was people holding up BLM signs and he wouldn't pull it out. So there's conversations in the fandom of like, why would he only recognize like trans flag, bi flag, but wouldn't recognize the BLM flag? And so then that, like in that fic, that conversation was like my kind of response to that of like how unfortunately, you know, a 20 something white male of privilege is going to sort of virtue signal movements that align with their brand. So it was, it was slightly observation on that, which kind of, I guess, leads into, um, I guess our kind of shared interest in fandom as a way of processing like an embodied, lived um, experience and a kind of way to explore otherness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, should we talk about um, Owens? Yeah. Okay. So um, on, in regards to otherness, Owen had this quote where he said, um, for me, my work will always be part of and in excess of art and fandom, perhaps in the same way that Slash uh, will always be part of gay relationships, but always in excess of them. Being a fan is about this excess, I think, and making art is about finding the other stuff that is in excess of language or logic. Um, so... Owen kind of, um, maybe you can speak about Owen's practice better. Um, yeah, so um, Owen, like, he kind of talked a bit earlier that, you know, he was doing his PhD and it was, like, really kind of sick of, like, art taxes and academic shit and, sorry, stuff. And um, so he got kind of into Tumblr and he actually said in our conversation how Tumblr in, like, 2013 was, like, New York in the 1960s. And it was kind of this way for him to kind of just disconnect from his academic work and his PhD and the theory. And he just kind of was really in awe of discovering all this fan art and was really kind of just blown away by the quality of it. But also like, again, we were kind of talking earlier, this blurriness of like the fan as a creator, the fan as a critic, the fan as an artist. And so, in his kind of exploration of fandom, like similar to ours, of then realizing, oh, well, it's actually quite serious. There is actually a, a pedagogy here. Um, there's an ethos, there's a methodology. So I think he was kind of, um, it's weird how it comes up in our art, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I guess like for you with cosplaying, maybe you can kind of talk about cosplaying tied to your identity. Yes. Um, <clears throat> So um, in our conversation, we were talking about how um, I have recently noticed, and it's a very sneaky thing for me because I never even knew this, that uh, a lot of my costumes uh, are influenced by Orthodox Jewish clothing, which you wouldn't expect by looking at my, clo of my, at my um, cosplay. But um, I noticed it because uh, I'm from North York, uh, an area that's, uh, I grew up in a really Orthodox area. And I had totally forgot about how I grew up around these things called shells, which are um, Orthodox Jewish women, and I've had to wear these too. It's like a really tight white um, underclothing that you wear on, on your shirt or your, like on your legs or something like that, and it just makes sure that uh, you're all covered. So you can do kind of fun things where you wear like a really, really sexy sh like dress, but you, you're wearing a shell underneath, so it's, it's fine. Um, and like, I feel like I was really good at it. Like I worked at an Orthodox Jewish camp and I had like the hottest outfits because I just like, I just knew how to work the shell. Anyways. Um, shell is gonna be hot in 2019. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just recently realized that like so much of my costumes are kind of influenced by uh, being, like growing up uh, Jewish and also in, in my neighborhood. And uh, I wasn't allowed to trick or treat but I was allowed to dress up for Purim. Purim is like a Jewish holiday um, and where there's like clowns and kings and princesses involved. And uh, that's kind of where I started 
dressing up a lot. But uh, I started going to uh, comic conventions and um, Anime North, like anime conventions. But I really started being irritated by it because there's this weird tension I felt where um, women are like slut shamed for being sexy or dressing sexy, but at the same time, like um, like thin white young women were uh, the only ones that were really getting attention. Uh, at the same time, I, I wanted to be sexy, but then I didn't like uh, being asked for pictures constantly, and it was, it was this really weird tension. Uh, so I start, kind of stopped going to comic conventions, and I started going online more, and I made my costumes more grotesque and freaky, and I've, I've just been kind of working off of that now, um, which is a really big change for me. And in my recent work that I just did where I serenaded the popcorn ceiling insulation in my apartment, uh, it was the first time I wasn't in costume. I was like, you know, I was like the person that was like really taking in the hotness of somebody else, because it was just me serenading, and then I had this dancer who was like really like beautifully dressed up like the popcorn ceiling insulation and I got to be the one that was like oh you're so hot or like I love you I just adore you I want you and that was a really good reversal for me even from like when I first started going to comic conventions it was exciting for me to not be like the object and to fawn over somebody else or something else um so something that we've kind of um and kind of connecting further, and I think maybe we'll, like, after this, we can open up for any questions. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about otherness, we, as much as we're in on certain fandom activities and fandom worlds, we do feel um, like outsiders. And um, when we were kind of talking about this of, like, being artists and kind of balancing our different kind of identities and practices, um, you know, Owen was recently at a fan studies, the fan studies network uh, conference uh, last month in Cardiff. And he kind of talked about, maybe I'll just go to the slide. Yeah. Um, and we'll just kind of, oh wait, I don't think it's here. Anyways, I'll just kind of relay like verbally here. Um, and uh, he was kind of talking about, uh, there's a presentation that was made by one of the presenters that was talking about how in Harry Potter there's a lot of memes and he was kind of observing how now the alt-right uh, is becoming uh, more common to co-op these like memes for like alt-right, you know, stuff. So propaganda. he was propaganda. And um, so he's been kind of doing this work. Um, well, he was at this kind of convent conference where they're showing these examples of how Harry Potter memes were being used. And we're not going to show it because it's just, you know, we don't want to... Contribute. C contribute. To um, it. So he's working on this work right now, very inspired by Angela Nagel's book, Kill All Normies, and is really now into anti fandom. Just because, like, now all these strategies that we had in the past years that were progressive and leftist are now being used um, by the has been co opted by the right. Um, and I think, too, we've talked about in fandoms, like, I'm sure any of you are familiar with Star Wars and the fandom around that and how there's been a strong reaction against the corporate, um, like, the, the corporate side has been really pushing for more representation, and then you have these really, like, you know, hurt white nerd dudes that are like, no, I want the Luke Skywalker narrative. Anyways, that's, like, a bunch of things to unpack. But, yeah. Maya, you were kind of really interested in that, observation that Owen made about Harry Potter and that twisting. Yeah, um, Owen made this really interesting point about like how everyone's kind of, uh, the left and the right are now really like interested in uh, villains. There's like this reclaiming of villains and um, what I found really interesting and I watched this really, really good uh, video essay by Lindsay Ellis. If you haven't heard of her, I definitely recommend looking up her um, video essays. And she was talking about how um, Villains right now in Disney are kind of um, are represented as like cool and stylish and badass, even though they're, they're you know they're complicated. They have backstories, um, but the kind of issue with th with that is that um, Disney kind of sometimes defaults to having the villains have kind of a fascist um, representation, like the, the way that they, they move about. So an example of this is like the stormtroopers or um, in The Lion King where um, 
it's uh, be prepared and the the hyenas are walking in like a in like a format that like it's like reminiscent of like nazis marching uh and so disney kind of like um and not just Disney, a lot of other um, cartoons and also like just representations of in popular media kind of just like borrows from uh, fascist imagery to be like these are the these are the villains you know you want to hate them right uh, but they do it in such a they do it in a really like lukewarm way so they just kind of grab a little bit of the aesthetic and then don't really uh, implement like why these are evil so then you just end up having like these very cool villains that are kind of uh, fascist or have fascist aesthetics but that you want to kind of empathize with and then the issue is with with this is that like uh, you know it's it's easy to make like this evil character who uh, can easily be co-opted by like the alt-right for being like a Nazi symbol and this kind of connects to with, um, you know, when we were talking about tin hatting in the 1D fandom and, um, you know, if there's anything there that, like, as exciting, as progressive as it is to sort of have these stories, works being created by, like, with, like women or gender non-binary of these, like, different forms of masculinity, like, there is... Um, there's this elimination of the fourth wall. So like 1D was basically the first kind of boy band of social media age and has like their success was really kind of made by their act, like how active they were on like Twitter and Tumblr and how they engaged with their fans. They did a lot of live streaming. It's worth mentioning how they were like a product of um, X Factor. So they were essentially like a reality TV manufactured boy band. And so the um, this closeness has kind of given some fans this like entitlement, and so uh, this when I talk about the breaking of this fourth wall, if you look at say like a Twitter update that Louis Tomlinson um, will do, you then have these tin hatters that swarm in. And I'm sure that you can kind of see this in any other example that swarm in and really kind of push like like. I feel bad for Louis Tomlinson because he's going to deal with his whole life all these like Tin Hatter Larrys that if he posts a picture of his son, they're like, that's not your son, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so like, whereas I think maybe Tenor, and I've been involved with fandom, fan fiction for like many years, and whereas like, like to, maybe like if it was live journal era, there was always this kind of like, this is sort of hidden away. Now there is not that. So you have like not only celebrities, but then also like, the producers, the owners of Disney at Marvel and like Harry Potter that are totally cognizant of fan activities. And, um, and I actually find these tensions and where this is going to go quite interesting because as you see, like there's now, like they're seeing this as participatory. They're seeing this as like transmedia. Um, and uh, yeah, that's all to say that it's an interesting moment right now. Again, this blurring of roles and um, authorship and what have you. So I guess like we can kind of maybe open up to, like we want to have time for questions. Yeah. So um, I guess we're going to put out like our own question that we're curious to have in dialogue, but you can also ask your own questions of, you know, we're very interested in what we can learn from fans. Like I think we're all kind of connected that we're continually like looking at fan practices and looking at what fans are doing and, and the kind of liminal spaces they operate. And that's really impacting us and our work and, and even how we organize, especially our online performances. So we're just kind of putting that out there. Anything else to add? No, that's perfect. Yeah, we okay. want to hear how you feel about that. Yeah, we want to hear how you feel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, testing? OK, hi. Um, great talk. I actually uh, first you. got into the internet because of fan fiction. I liked reading it as a kid. Uh, there wasn't a lot of other things to do on the internet back then. So. Um, <laughs> I, I'm really, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on. I had this sort of observation that, and this is largely this was my. Re I, so I, I founded NeoCities several, like four or five years ago now, and I'm like it's a, another GeoCities where people could just make creative sites and stuff. And I've had this sort of perception that and this was a lot of the reason why I decided to make it is that the the internet sort of is becoming flash, you know, and tying it into this whole conference too, like this internet's becoming more centralized and it's sort of becoming centralized in this way where it's sort of becoming in many respects like anti-intellectual, like it's becoming very flashy, a lot of like graphics and like short blurbs and 
uh, you know, movie videos and stuff like that. And I, I've always sort of wondered if fan fiction and thing and sort of like writing uh, and, and sort of reading long things as entertainment has sort of been a victim of that of that sort of or or is it just sort of transcending into that medium? You know, is is Tumblr a good a good thing or a bad thing for fan fiction, for example? Um, I was wondering what your thoughts would be on that. You take this. Okay. Yeah. So that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, because I actually think that for sure, when we think about internet culture and we think about like GeoCities era and like storytelling, the way um, hypertext linking, like if you look at early internet um, artworks, like they would do these massive art projects where you would like, okay, click on here and you go to this other page and you know, and now like, yeah, like Tumblr and like tw like tweets and, and how many characters um, that has an Im image macros and GIFs, we've definitely become more image based in, uh, in online culture. But I have to say that I think like, you know, like looking on fanfiction.net and reading like a 60 chapter epic that's like in a series of seven others and it's unfinished. <laughs> Fucking hell. Still being revised. Still being revised. <laughs> Anyways, so, um, but I think that that's being co-opted by mainstream because, like, the way that now with, tel like, TV watching and how people, when, like, of a certain TV show, they're live tweeting during it, and then the serialization and, like, looking at Game of Thrones, like, now I think that kind of um, serialization, which actually connects back, if you're thinking literary culture, if you think about authors like Charles Dickens, he wrote his novels explicitly to be excerpts papers and the length of it was because of economic reasons that he was trying to get more money so that's why like victorian era novels are so lengthy because of economic reasons <laughs> he just wanted to get that money um so i still think length is at play there and i think though what is happening is that kind of um dialoguing that would happen in comments or like in e-letters now you see that through like reblogging and retweeting. Um, if there's any challenges there, I think that because of the internet being a centralized place, um, I don't think fans have a sense of what the ownership of their their work. And I also think that sometimes, uh, especially when you look at Twitter and Tumblr, like fans are opening themselves up to being misinterpreted because then you have like say like a Graham Norton who comes in and he shows like he flashes some weird fan art for like Tom Hiddleston. And I don't mind if Tom Hiddleston sees like fan art, I do, but don't show the one where he's on a, like as Loki on a, you know, a stripper pole. Like I have other work. So that's, I'm just like relaying how the ways that then the mainstream kind of pulls this stuff out of context and makes fun of it and I don't and demeans it which I think you know we don't like that no. <laughs> oh yeah I'll use the mic um hi thank so your um, thank you for your talk it's really great and you've covered a lot of things one of the things um I think that I've been thinking about and about the shame and uh, around it and how how do you feel that that contributes to how fandoms and fan creators feel marginalized and then become less threatening to like the copyright holders so i because i'm part of a fandom and i notice a lot of creators will talk about feeling like kind of almost like i feel bad for doing this because the author doesn't like it or whatever and i feel to me like F that, like, <laughs> you know, like, you should, but I think that shame, and I hear it a lot, and I even, Owen mentioned it in the beginning of his talk, mm -hmm. contributes to the marginalization and also to keeping the fandom down, which then keeps it economically not viable. So are there ways, is that changing? Are there ways for it to become economically viable, like, within that? Or what are you seeing, I guess, around that kind of stuff? Um, I don't know. Do you want to take a stab at that? Um, sure. I do think that it is changing. I think um, fandoms are becoming more normalized. Um, like I'm, I'm pretty sure Tom Hiddleston does know that there's um, fan art about him. But he also, probably has a Google News alert for like his name and fan <laughs> art. <laughs> Um, but I think that uh, even uh, corporations are like paying attention to how fans are reacting, and they're like <laughs> learning from that. Um, learning, which means they're speaking to ideas. Like 
Um, yeah. And then the fan creators aren't getting anything back for that. So it creates this exploitive relationship. Well, exactly. there's a good example, though. Like, um, there's a piece written by, um, I forget the name of the writer, but they were kind of making this observation that when One Direction went on hiatus, they're not broken up. It's hiatus. <laughs> um, <laughs> So when they went on hi hiatus, there was this need to fill, like, you know, so what had happened was that you saw then young adult publishers publish essentially fan fics, like, that were originally, like, kind of 1D, but fictionalized, and then publishing these stories. So um, there's one, uh, Grace and the Fever, written by Zan... Um, Zan Romero is a great, it made me cry actually, it was such a good book. But like I think that the, um, and then there was a recent incident where there was a Star Trek fan film that like fundraised uh, through like one of those online fundraisers and um, I guess Paramount, like they fundraised like almost like t um, over a million and it was like a high budget fan film. They even had like actors from the series like playing their roles, like side actors. And so then it got, apparently they, Paramount kind of swooped in and tried to shut it down, but there was such this strong reaction that they, they stepped away. And Star Trek is a very interesting fandom because Star Trek is actually like the birth of kind of fandom. Like Slash came out of Star Trek with the slash between Kirk and Spock. So I think that like the the cor copyright holders, the, the corporations, they are kind of pulling, but then there's such as mobilizing now with like fan cons and like theorizing with fan studies that I, I think there is kind of still activity and, and protectiveness. Um, like Archive of Our Own is like a nonprofit that publishes, supports like fan works and is actually really, uh, really committed to the history of fan works. Um, but I think that like the space that we kind of operate in is that I don't think, like I know we've talked about not necessarily be feeling supported in like doing artwork, like in an art world context, exploring these ideas. Um, like we were talking earlier about like you kind of working and sometimes with curators or artists that don't necessarily have a digital kind of vernacular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's really frustrating, but it's yeah. frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I talked with publishers once, not to other people. <laughs> this is the last thing I'll say, but, um, and I tried to talk about the online and be like, yeah, there's, I have a lot of followers online of what I'm writing and they were like, Oh yeah, yeah, whatever. Like they did it, it was very, I was like, really? And they they were literary agents, but they just didn't get the, the it, it was obvious they didn't get it. It was like, as soon as you said that you published online, huh. they were like, oh yeah, that's something down here, like low or so, whatever. Um, so it was really interesting to see how that's viewed. Um, and Wattpad's like like local like break up's Wattpad because they're actually like their whole model. A lot of the stories that they're getting published were like fanfics, and um, I think like you see in the music industry how like there's actually certain bands that are signed um, because like they're looking at what their fan ba fan base is. Like SoundCloud rap is a genre, right? So you're seeing like at least in the music industry that those metrics are coming into play with the decisions. Um, and I think that's going to eventually change in like the literary space. It'll be interesting to see wh how that impacts like film and television, because uh, like television in particular right now is such this kind of domain of like really exciting storytelling that has exciting fandoms that really feed into that. So it's it's an exciting time, I guess. Uh, is there any questions? Oh, here. Hi. Uh, so, um, one of the themes I'm kind of hearing in the conversation that's been happening is um, fandom as an act of threatening copyright. Um, and the story that you just told about kind of Paramount coming down punitively, kind of like a, maybe like we m might imagine um, a government censoring content on the internet inside its boundaries. Um, so I was wondering if you could think of any or knew of any examples of fandoms using sort of tools for censorship resistance to get around um, punitive corporate uh, takedown notices. Do you know anything of any? 
Yeah, I guess like so many years back, writers when they would publish their stories would just like would have a disclaimer. So they would you would always see this in stories that were published on like fanfiction.net or like like disclaimer. I don't know own any of these characters. This never happened. I'm just a fan and blah blah blah. This I don't own these characters. There's like so many variations on that statement. Um, I think like you know uh, and there was a time like Anne Rice in the early zeros was actually quite litigious against her uh, speculative fiction writers. So she actually like is issued cease and desist letters to these writers, which like today, corporate people like they would not do that. That's like so bad for like a at a time when like I think media habits are so decentralized and media companies are so desperate to kind of hold audience because they're so scared of the internet. Like that is like the worst thing for them to do. So, and there's also like we mentioned like archive our own, there's actually like these spaces that are quite safe and protected that um, if you really have to dig deep to find the really incriminating like, and they're in a ways like they're kind of community managed, you know, if you have anything else to add. No. Yeah, after that, us, yeah, okay. Uh, I guess this is a question about what, the new term to me, anti-fic, that it sounds like it's a positioning response to groups like the alt-right kind of using the social technology that the, the fanfic community has created. Do I have that right, anti-fic? Anti-fic, have you heard of that before? <laughs> Um, thought, do you oh, think wait, we I were talking about the anti-fandom oh, that anti we were talking about? Yeah, 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 you mentioned someone, yeah, sorry, am yeah, I that was a Owen. that was kind of Owen's project. Oh, okay. Um, what were you saying? Well, I guess I was just wondering, it's, um, I was trying to, like, think how it might be like in, like, uh, anti-censorship communities, uh, like, there's kind of, because it's hard technology that has very solid rules, there's this idea that, oh, people are going to use it for bad stuff, and we just have to accept that, and you don't see anyone having that realization and then becoming anti-anti-censorship like they just stay and they commit to like our technology will be used for bad things and they grapple mm -hmm. with that. And I was wondering, is there any conversations like that in the in the fanfic communities about like that sort of way that the people who you don't like are using, they're standing on the shoulders of like what the community, the fanfic community has done, the fandom communities have done. Yeah, I mean, I wonder because I feel like this is interesting within cosplay. Yeah. Yeah, like maybe you can kind of relate how that connects with cosplay because. Yeah, um, so there's always like this worry that um, what you're gonna make is gonna be used for like a bad reason or something, or it's gonna be reappropriated. Um, and I think some of the ways that I've dealt with that is to make whatever you're making that's uh, you want to be protected like gross, and so that people don't want to to use it, or like <laughs> it's uh, they feel kind of uncomfortable by it. So uh, there's no way that someone would want to, uh, it, it's so obviously uh, very specific that people wouldn't want to use it. Like um, in that same video essay that I was just talking about by Lindsay Ellis, she was speaking about how um, there's a lot of films like um, Inglorious Bastards where uh, the representation of Nazis are like kind of badass and they're very cool and it's really easy to be like, this is obviously a, uh, like some like a, a really interesting film that's died like going through all these themes, but it's really easy to take like the coolness of the characters out of context. But then there's a film called like The Producers, where um, where like there's a scene called like Springtime for Hitler, and like it's there's this this guy and he um, this queer man and he's like. Um, cosplaying as as Hitler and he's absurd and it's and it's ridiculous and and there's no way that the all right is gonna like take a really like this like queer amazing like uh, insane Hitler and be like this is our <laughs> hero right yeah. and like so you just gotta make and like I had to actually make like a like a Nazi character for my film that I have to defeat and it was really hard to be like what are you gonna look like for you to like not be used later so yeah I had to make him really like he's He's wearing like this, like he's kind of like a he's wearing a muscle shirt, like a very obvious like muscle shirt, and like a swim, like a um, you know those like um, uh, like a, the people who protect the pools, lifeguards. Oh, yeah, lifeguards. Uh, <laughs> he's wearing like a lifeguard shirt, but instead of like the thing, he's he has like the swastika, and so like and it and it, he looks insane. He looks. 
he looks really uncool, and he's a very uncool character. And I'm like, okay, this this can't be used. He can't become cool or re reused in that way. And that's the kind of way that I've thought about how to do yeah, it. Yeah, because I think we are like interested. In, I guess we'll just like this last uh, question, but. Um, yeah, like, I think that it thrives. Like, there's such subversion and criticality and nuanced meaning. And, like, sure, like, the Fifty Shades is easy to co-op, but, like, no, like, Omegaverse, male pregnancy, yeah. like, that's... I, actually, I think I found, like, someone's talking about, like, a fight, like, if does M-Preg fic exist for, like, Putin and Trump? It does. So I think that for there's sure. just ways that make it so, like, impossible for the copyright because it's not heteronormative it's like so kind of offensive and like unproducible it would be sued so that still exists thank you thank you